Good morning, Commissioner. Here, here we are again on a uh, actually a gorgeous um, Sunday afternoon. It's June seventh, uh, twenty twenty. Hope you're doing well. Pretty busy weekend. Yep. How about you? Busy, busy week. But I think um, as an agency, we're really doing some tremendous work, and um, certainly have many challenges ahead. Um, so many of which you're going you're gonna to talk about today on our weekly video. So. Mm -hmm. Why don't we why don't we have you jump right into your thoughts and pieces of our work that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, you know, the last week has been about a lot of reflection about where we as an agency fit in the continuum of the broader conversation that's occurring across the country related to race. Um, where I, you know, personally stand on uh, much of the positions that have been taken, and you know, collectively, where does the person in the professional fit in all of this. And, you know, where I landed is, you know, the same, I'm the same person today um, as I was at my appointment a year and a half ago, you know? And so when I think about the excitement that we collectively felt across the agency to have someone who's worked, you know, for DCF for as long as I have in this seat and the perspective that I bring to this work, um, I'm excited just as much today about the prospect of how to move DCF forward in that same vein and you know 3200 staff members we have a lot of diverse opinions we have a lot of diverse people from a lot of diverse backgrounds and i think that positions us really well as an agency to be reflective and to think about ourselves and the work that we do as a uh, way to be able to help not only move um, the climate of our uh, work environment forward but also the climate of our outcomes for kids and families forward. So I, you know, I'm approaching this as, you know, the agency's first African American uh, commissioner, but also recognizing that my race matters, as does, as does the race of all of uh, the staff that we represent, along with their collective experiences that we bring to the work. Um, and that should not be, you know, taken away from who we are or taken away from the work that we do. Um, it adds to and complements how we do our work. So I, I think if I go forward with my authentic self, um, if I move forward in the way that I've always known how to do this work, lifting up what we know has worked really well for the agency, but then also um, being able to be honest and critical of ways that we can improve and we can, uh, you know, improve outcomes for kids and families. Our role for DCF is taking care of all of Connecticut's children. And if we know that the outcomes for children of color in Connecticut are disparate, it's our job to start to formulate strategies to improve that. You know, it's my job to make sure that our whole workforce is heard. And, it, you know, I, I need to make sure that I make room for all voices because, you know, as you've said, and some of the other members of our team, we've gotten a lot of feedback from people this week and, you know, a lot of um, differences of opinion and differences of perspective. And, you know, we're, we're making room for all voices to kind of help us know how to strategize and how to move forward. You know, some people have shared some pretty personal things about their own upbringing, about their own experiences right here in DCF. And uh, some of it hard to hear. Some people grappling with whether or not this is still the right fit for them. Choice, but at the end of the day, we have to make sure that um, we uh, use all of that and planning to move forward how to best serve kids and families. Mm -hmm. And Commissioner, I want to put a, uh, a visual up that we know you wanted to talk a little bit about today. Uh, the title of it is Creating and Nurturing a Culture of Safety. Can you explain to staff the importance of this? Yeah, can you just make it full screen and then I can um, see all of the headings because they're cut off a little bit yep. for me, but I want it. Yeah, that's perfect. That's better? Um, perfect. Yeah. As we have started to move our discussion about um, safety culture, we've used the, the term culture of safety to signify how we at DCF will start to think about doing this work in a climate that is safe, but also that people feel heard. And so what people will start to hear um, in the next you know, several weeks as we start to unpack this and really put some um, uh, dimensions around a culture of safety. We will be doing so in a framing that um, emphasizes five different uh, key areas of how we frame out a culture of safety. Um, and, and specifically, racial justice fits into this in terms of how staff can um, 
recognize our values, our attitudes and behaviors that support psychological and physical safety uh, in the workforce and across how we serve uh, kids and families. And if you see, it starts in that kind of regulating our mind and our emotions um, around well-being of others, uh, you know, and just thinking about, you know, where I fit in all of this. Then how we relate to each other is kind of the next piece of that. How we, you know, move our work forward is the rise piece, being brave and bold about our actions to address um, everything we've heard in the kind of regulation and relating phase with each other. How we make sense of this is the reasoning phase um, through teamwork and consideration and consultation and sharing knowledge across each other. And then last, how we respond how we respond in a way that is confident, compassionate, and, and with an emphasis on how we problem solve towards issues within the workplace, as well as issues involving our interface with kids and families. And, you know, this was under development far um, long before yep. the current discussion that has kind of um, taken place over the airways. And, you know, as we think about DCF's role in understanding um, uh, racial injustice and you know equity in the the way we do our business and in the workplace. Uh, I, I strongly believe that DCF is positioned um, in a way that can help us move in the right right direction because of all of the foundational work that has been uh, laid ahead of this. So more to come on the culture of safety in the uh, issue and the framework under safe and sound. But I just wanted to put that visual up to give some uh, give folks a sense of the framing that, you know, we'll be approaching over the next few months. And certainly, Commissioner, uh, uh, so much of your work in leading our agency has been collaboration with outside entities, and you call them our community partners, mm -hmm. legislators, our contracted providers, schools, our sister state agencies. And as we know, we, we are connected in so many different ways to law enforcement mm -hmm. who obviously right now um, as as a group as a discipline are facing extreme scrutiny in their work how yeah. is that going to impact our work and what is what is your messaging for our staff around that topic yeah that's one that I think um, we have to give some voice to because one of the groups that I um, as you just mentioned that right out of the gate I realized we had to have some uh, conversations with and level setting was um, law enforcement one of the first early groups were also educators but specifically in that law enforcement conversation is you know as I think about my role throughout the department um, um, and my the way I've always done business is as an investigator and as a social worker over the years, I can't imagine doing this work absent our yeah. partnerships. Yeah. And we work really closely with law enforcement and um, we will continue to work closely with law enforcement. And to that regard, as you think about uh, the use of excessive force or uh, police's authority, law enforcement is going to have to grapple with that as a discipline. And we recognize that they have really, really complex roles to play as they interface with communities, some of the same communities that we serve. So, you know, for us, we have to think about the role of implicit bias in the way we do our business, but then also how we partner with our other stakeholder groups across the board as we tackle implicit bias in the decision making. So, you know, I consider law enforcement to be a partner to child protection, but I also recognize that there are things within all of our disciplines that we have to take a really good hard look at and things that we will say are just not acceptable. And we have to stand by that um, as to who we are in child protection, and they will have to grapple with that in their um, role as, as to how they interface with communities as well. Mm -hmm. And as all of these dynamics are happening, relationships, looking internally at ourselves, systems within the department to ensure that um, all voices are being heard, we are still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. Uh, Connecticut is, has, is in the, is, has commenced um, phase one. We're moving towards phase two. And, and uh -huh. over the last three videos, you've spoken a lot about our resuming uh, of full operations. Uh -huh. Today's video is embedded in a memo which talks about parent and child visitation resuming. Uh -huh. Can you expand on that? 
So a portion of parent-child visitation starts, you know, relaxation of our complete restriction on um, in-person visitation is going to uh, be relaxed consistent with phase two of the Connecticut reopening efforts. We're trying to align a little bit on a timeline that reflects the data that we're learning from a public health standpoint. So, you know, when you think about phase two of Connecticut's reopening, kind of the phase one for DCF's relaxation of some of those visitation restrictions will happen around mid-June. So that kind of June 15th as a target yeah. to mm -hmm. start to relax some of the restrictions at Solnit and congregate facilities, relaxing some of the visitation restrictions as it relates to our community nonprofit congregate providers. They'll have to make some decisions around what makes sense for their specific facilities um, and what's best, what's in the best interest of kids and families. Um, and then also from a public health standpoint, what cohorts of kids that we have in care, um, should we start to apply a visitation triage process uh, that allows for some more in-person visits that take into account public safety? We want to continue virtual visits. We want to continue um, more contact between bio families and foster families in a way if it's virtual um, that makes sense for everyone. But you know, as we relax some of the visitation restrictions, we want to allow for safe uh, in-person visitation in, in limited, uh, in limited areas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the memo expands on that a little bit. And certainly there's going to be questions and supervision and consults and an entire triage process put mm -hmm. into place. Yeah. Um, Commissioner, last week you mentioned, uh, and highlighted three words that you believe are, are, are so important as we look at our work and our relationships amongst each other with our foster parents, our providers, our families. Understanding, empathy, and authenticity. How mm -hmm. are those words still so important as we are yet here again? Still ringing true this week, you know, understanding each other, you know, listening to the role of uh, child protection in the work and, and the people who do the work. Um, you know, empathy for the folks that we serve, as well as the folks that we are charged with leading the people who serve. Um, you know, and then the the last piece of authenticity. You know, boy, I tell you, over the last year, we spent a lot of time creating a different narrative for who DCF is, and I think this is um, a, a line of demarcation to be able to really stand up and be leaders as to how you craft and you talk honestly and openly about race and about child protection. And I think, you know, you know, we've had a long, long standing struggle to really try to reconcile the two in the work that we do. And, you know, we're not, of course, where we would like to be, but we certainly aren't where we were. And our staff understand that and we understand that it's complex and there's a lot of, you know, movement that we still have to make in the right direction. But if we approach it from a place of understanding, a place of empathy and a place of authenticity, I, th I think that, you know, we are foundationally ready to take that next step. Yeah. So I think at this point in the video is typically where you announce um, and review the number of positive COVID-19 diagnoses we've had with our foster parents, youth and our own staff. Yeah, we want to give people an opportunity to log off if you do not want to hear that. And we also, you know, as we give this data, recognize that we're moving in the right direction, Ken. It, you know, we took a lot of precautions to do some contact tracing and, you know, terminal cleaning and all those things that we put in place early on, our teleworking and the things that we did to reduce the number of people in specific locations across the department, improving um, our access to testing for staff. And I think it's paying off. So we've had um, 34 staff members test positive with 30 of them having returned to work, which mm -hmm. we're happy, so happy about. Um, we have 64 foster parents that have tested positive. That's still a number that, although relatively small when you think of the full number of foster parents we have across the department, but still concerning enough that it, it continues to rise based on the number of foster parents who are essential workers or healthcare workers themselves um, mm -hmm. that, that are in that kind of category. 
Uh, so 24 TFC foster parents and 40 core and kin making up that 64. Um, mm -hmm. The number of kids in care that have had a COVID-19 um, positive diagnosis is 15. We are looking at that number a little bit more critically as um, the number of kids in foster homes starts to rise a little bit in terms of positive. And then, of course, in relation to the multi um, multi-syndrome, uh, multi-symptom syndrome that um, our medical department is, is following pretty closely on children who have had a positive diagnosis of COVID and then developed those additional symptoms. We haven't had any of the kids in DCF care test positive for that or diagnosed with that, but we're, you know, led by our wonderful medical director, yeah. Dr. Nicole Taylor, really following those closely. Yeah, yeah. So Commissioner, I think the, that outlines um, the week we've had and, and, and the week moving forward. Any, uh, any closing thoughts here for the staff? Yeah, just one last thing I forgot to mention earlier, and I probably should repeat it again um, in next week's video. We encourage people to, you know, voice their perspective, um, whether it's to us or participation in an organized way, but just recognizing and reminding people that um, you're connected professionally to the department and people should keep that in mind, review social media policy and recognize that, you know, I have the authority to speak for the department, but sometimes people will um, view your role within the department Department through that lens. So just being mindful of that. Sure. And we can probably highlight that um, in future videos as well to continue to confirm that message. So yeah. All right. All right. All right. We'll have a great week and uh, we'll, we'll see each other. We'll see each other very soon. All right, Ken. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye bye.